Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. And today we're going to be looking at the forgotten prologue to World War I, the Balkan Wars of 1912 to 1913. Now, I've covered a lot of World War I videos on this channel before, but I thought it'd be time to take a proper look at this one because it is a very, very important event for Southeastern Europe. Within, I mean, two years, the entire map of the region was redrawn. The Balkan nationalism really came to a boiling point here. And it was one of the prologues to the First World War, of course. All these nations would be affected by these wars. And the alliances between all of these countries would eventually break and crumble and reform into the, not only the First Balkan Wars, but also the Second Balkan Wars, too, which this video will cover both of them from the Great War Channel. So I'm really excited to have a look at this. It's a I, I don't know if it's really a forgotten prologue. I would say that it's pretty well known. Not like another video that will be coming up this week. But hey, nonetheless, I, I'm curious what you guys think of this one. I'm really excited to check it out. So let's take a look. If you haven't already yet, please remember to like, comment, subscribe. Let's get into it. In 1912 and 1913, the Balkans were torn apart by not one, but two wars that radically changed the map, nearly dragged Europe into a general war, caused untold civilian suffering, and helped set the stage for the First World War. The armies of the Balkan League marched together against the ailing Ottoman Empire, only for alliances to change, and all turned against one. It's the Balkan Wars. For centuries, the Ottoman Empire controlled the multi-ethnic and multi-religious Balkan Peninsula, but the 19th century brought dramatic change. As the empire grew weaker and nationalism among the Balkan peoples grew stronger, new states emerged. Montenegro, Greece, Serbia, Romania, and Bulgaria gained first informal and later formal independence. Yeah, and I do just want to say here too, if I could just go back five few seconds here is that the nationalism within the Balkans too, this is really happening all over Europe during this point, right? Especially in their neighbor here, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, where you have nationalism for the, the Czechs that are living there, the Poles, the Hungarians, obviously the Austrians themselves, Croatians, as well as the other minority um, ethnicities that are in these empires as well. And so nationalism is really springing up and it's one of the causes um, for the First World War as well. So yeah, you can see here, it's, it's kind of crazy to think now in, in 2023 that one nation controlled all these mass areas. Crazy. Romania and Bulgaria gained first informal and later formal independence. This did not happen without bloodshed, including uprisings, Ottoman repression, independence wars, and great power intervention to protect their own interests. The decisive Russian victory in the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-78 ensured the independence of the Balkan states, but also provoked the suspicions of the other powers by creating a large and Russia-friendly Bulgaria. A concerned Austria-Hungary occupied Ottoman Bosnia and Herzegovina and the Sanjak of Novi Pazar in 1878, and Britain worried that Russia might get too close to the Turkish Straits. So the powers met in Berlin to modify the borders mm, of the preliminary peace of San Stefano to limit Russian influence. They returned most of Macedonia to the Ottomans, which angered Bulgarian leaders like Ivan Geshov. When we read the agreement in which a short-sighted diplomacy in Berlin partitioned our homeland, we were left crushed and thunderstruck. Was such an injustice possible? Could such an injustice be reversed? The peace of 1878 did not stabilize the region, as no state was satisfied with the resulting borders. Serbia and Bulgaria even fought a brief war in 1885, as did Greece and the Ottomans in 1897. By the start of the... And I wonder if this was really the beginning. I mean, Bismarck's obviously probably one of his most famous quotes is that, you know, there will be a, wor there will be a world outbreak or a global conflict or something along these lines within 20 years, and, and it would, the, the Balkans would be the cause of it. And he did that in 1894, and then 20 years later, right, right on the dot, he was completely correct. And so I wonder how much of this experience really shaped his opinion on the Balkans. Um, Bismarck, obviously, at this point, being one of the leaders of Germany. So, 20th century, local and great power tensions in the Balkans were running high. The new states hoped to expand their territory at the expense of the Ottomans and each other, and the great powers were still nervous about the balance of power in the region. Austria-Hungary worried that Serbia was a danger, since some in Serbia also wanted closer ties with their fellow Serbs and other South Slavs in the yes. dual monarchy, and Serbia had close relations with Russia. 
Russia was glad to have new allies in the Balkans and wanted access to the Turkish Straits, but worried that someone else might get their hands on Constantinople if the Ottomans collapsed completely. The Ottoman Empire was in a state of crisis externally and internally. Its defeats had cost it much of its European lands and brought violent instability at home. 1908, though, would be a decisive year. The Young Turk Revolution in July brought a fresh constitution and a desire to modernize the empire and army, create a stronger Ottoman identity, and preserve Ottoman territories, in particular hmm. Macedonia. But in October, Austria-Hungary shook the Balkans and Europe by annexing Bosnia after 30 years of occupation and withdrawing from Novi Pazar. Russia was outraged, and Bulgaria used the opportunity to sever all formal ties to the Ottomans. The result was more international tension and more chaos in Constantinople. Conservative forces tried to overthrow the new Ottoman constitution in 1909, which led to a counter-coup, yet another constitution, and a new sultan, Mehmet V. The next year, even formal control of Crete was lost, and Albanians revolted in favor of more autonomy with Montenegrin support. The Balkan states also had their share of problems, with Serbia and Greece suffering coups of their own, and all nations having difficulty exerting political control over their influential and nationalistic military leadership. Mm. While the Balkans and the Ottoman Empire were in turmoil, in 1911, Italy decided the time was right to expand its empire. Traditionally, Britain, France, and more recently Germany had supported the Ottoman Empire to prevent a total collapse. Oh. But now, they allowed Italy to attack and occupy Ottoman Libya right. and the Dodecanese Islands. Right. The Italo-Turkish War of 1911-12 ended with defeat for the Ottomans, who tried to limit their losses at the negotiating table. But the Balkan states had been watching closely and planned to take advantage of Ottoman troubles with Russian encouragement. The Serbian and Bulgarian governments began alliance talks in fall 1911, just after the Italo-Turkish War began, and in March 1912, they agreed on a defensive alliance, which changed to an offensive alliance in May. Soon after, Montenegro and Greece joined with separate agreements, and the Balkan League was born. The League resolved to make war on the Ottoman Empire to gain what they felt were lands that belonged to their peoples, but they had conflicting claims they all said dated back to medieval times. Hmm. Serbia, Bulgaria, and Greece wanted Macedonia, while Bulgaria and Greece both wanted Thrace. Montenegro and Serbia wanted the Sanjak of Novi Pazar, the area around the port of Scutari on the Adriatic, and Kosovo. The Albanians hoped for autonomy, which would also include Scutari and Kosovo. And what's funny too is that these, like some of these claims, at least from my experience, is like what they're still around today. I mean, even today, you still have the Kosovo issue within Serbia, right? The, the tensions between Serbia and Albania, Montenegro. And I mean, with all this, and this is beautifully well done, I think this is so well visually executed, right? You haven't even fought the first war and you already see where the second one's coming from, right? The fact that all this territory and the multiple claims that these countries have over it. And the other fact of the matter is too, is that unlike obviously in, in Central and Western Europe, you don't have one large country, you know, you don't have a Germany or, or an Austria-Hungary or, or France or anything like this to really come and say, yes, I'm the majority power, I deserve these claims. All of these are smaller countries that are then fighting for these smaller pieces of land, right? And maybe maybe there's something along those lines of where these are so, how these are still continuing on, right? In most of these regions... I should be clear though, though obviously not even close to the same extent as it was happening over 100 years ago. Just want to be clear on that. Regions, ...the mix of nationalities and religions did not align with political plans. Turks, Albanians, Bulgarians, Serbs, Montenegrins, Greeks, Jews, and other groups all lived in communities that overlapped over the centuries. Yep. The League wanted to take territory from the Ottomans, but made few formal agreements on how it would be divided. Serbia and Bulgaria agreed on how to divide part of Macedonia, but part was considered a disputed zone that could be assigned after the war with Russian arbitration. So the Balkan League determined to make war on the Ottomans without a clear post-war plan to divide the spoils. Nice. But first, they would have to defeat the Ottoman army, just as the Italians had done. 
The First Balkan War began on October 8, 1912, when Montenegro attacked the Ottomans ahead of schedule to get the jump on rival Serbia. The rest of the Balkan League members quickly gave the Ottomans a pro forma ultimatum. Hard-pressed Ottoman Grand Vizier Ahmed Mutar Pasha wanted to save the peace and even demobilized part of the Ottoman Third Army in Thrace, but the influential Young Turk Party called the Committee for Union and Progress wanted to fight. The empire was again at the brink of civil war, but declared war on the Balkan League on October 16th. Most European observers expected that the Ottomans would win. The empire's population of 24 million was more than twice the league's combined 10 million, and on paper the Ottomans could field 600,000 men. The regular troops also had gained experience fighting the Italians and rebels in Albania and Macedonia. Mm. But the Ottomans also faced problems. Many of their best officers, like Mustafa Kemal and Enver Bey, were stuck in Libya, uh, yes. and the reserve troops were badly trained and equipped with a mishmash of weaponry. The Ottoman navy was weak, and the army only had 315,000 men in Europe. The Balkan League could count on 825,000 soldiers, 350,000 Bulgarians, 230,000 Serbs, 200,000 Greeks, and 45,000 Montenegrins. Most of the soldiers were peasant conscripts, equipped with a variety of European weapons, including French and German artillery and a few observation aircraft. The Greek hmm. navy, with 16 destroyers and an armored cruiser, ensured control of the Aegean Sea. When the great powers issued a statement on October 10th saying that they wanted to keep the territorial status quo if it came to war, what they really meant was they would not allow the Ottomans to expand if they won. All over the Balkans, families saw their young men off to the front, including Bulgarian Netku Kablishkov's 21-year-old son, Anton. By noon, Anton's so chest welcome. was overflowing with flowers from well-wishers, and we sent him off to the train station. On the way, we ran into a crippled Greek. This meeting was a bad omen. I feared that my son would also be crippled. I wanted us to go back, but I didn't want to discourage him, so we continued on towards the station. In eastern Thrace, three Bulgarian armies faced the Ottoman First Army. The Ottomans thought the Bulgarians would move on Macedonia, so that's where they had most of their troops. But the Bulgarians instead send the bulk of their units towards the fortress towns of Edirne uh, and Kirkkilise, also known as Adrianople and Lozengrad, on the road to Constantinople. Bulgarian troops surrounded the Ottoman garrison at Edirne, and Bulgarian Deputy Commander-in-Chief Mikhail Savov said that he was ready to sacrifice 100,000 men to storm it. The Bulgarians did not storm the fortress, but young Anton Kablishkov was killed just outside its walls. East of Edirne, Ottoman First Army commander Abdullah Pasha thought he outnumbered the enemy, so he sent his troops forward in a hasty advance on October 21st. At the Battle of Kirkkilise, the outnumbered Ottomans fought for three days before the Bulgarians broke their lines. The Bulgarians could probably have completely smashed the Ottoman army if they had pursued them, but instead they rested while the Ottomans rushed in reinforcements and restored discipline. Mm. Ottoman senior officer Mutar Pasha reflected on the disaster. The causes of our defeat are to be found in our bad military organization and in the lack of discipline of our reservists. But the principal cause was the rain, which had continued for a week, completely destroying the morale of our army, and for three days, rendering impassable the roads and fields to our trains and artillery. So if this photo is an actual photo here, right, and this isn't taken, <laughs> it is an actual photo, shocking. No, I mean, if this is actually um, a photo of the army here, Right, and this is just taken out of context. It's just some random militia in a small village. Maybe they're preparing, but this is a photo of the fighting troops. One, this guy doesn't even have any shoes, right? First off, I don't think the man behind him either does, and neither does this man here. So one of them has a rifle, though, again, they might just be moving towards something here. But I mean, look at the state of this, right? Again, I hope this photo... Is, is, is not just a random one of, I don't know, maybe they're walking a recruiting station, I have no idea. But yeah, three of these guys don't have any shoes on. I mean, oof. On the 29th, the Bulgarians attacked the fresh Ottoman defensive positions at Lulier Burgas. At first, the Ottomans were able to hold the line, but when their logistics couldn't furnish the guns with enough shells, the Bulgarians again defeat them thanks to determined infantry attacks and superior artillery. 
Each side suffered 20,000 killed and wounded in the largest battle in Europe between 1871 and 1914. Mm. On November 2nd, reeling Ottoman forces retreated to the Chatalja line, just 30 kilometers from the imperial capital of Constantinople. The Ottoman government requested an armistice, but Bulgarian Tsar Ferdinand refused and did not inform his allies. On November 17th, the Bulgarians tried to break through the Chatalja line and fulfilled Tsar Ferdinand's dream of reaching the old Byzantine capital. But fierce Ottoman resistance, stretched logistics, and a cholera outbreak stopped them. Mm. Still, with Bulgarian advances on land and the Greek navy off the coast, Ottoman forces in the rest of the Balkans had been cut off. Some of the towns and villages captured by Bulgarian troops in Thrace were populated by Bulgarians, many of whom considered themselves liberated. Elena Bijeva later recalled when Bulgarian irregulars, among them poet Peyu Yavorov, entered her town. When the people entered the church, they took off their fezes and held them in their hands, and Yavorov sat on the priest's chair and began speaking. He said we were free and that we needn't fear Turkish prisons anymore. Then he asked, what will you do with those fezes? And they all tossed them to the ground and trampled them. It was like they were taking out all their anger at the Turks on those fezes. Meanwhile, in Macedonia, Serbian forces came up against Ottoman resistance quicker than General Radomir Putnik expected at Kumanovo. The Serbs outnumbered the Ottoman Vardar army 100,000 to 58,000, but the Ottomans under Zeki Pasha launched the first attacks on October 23rd. In the driving rain and mud, the Serbs counterattacked at great cost, which observers compared to the Japanese attacks in the Russo-Japanese War. But the firepower of modern artillery and machine guns meant soldiers dig trenches and foxholes to keep out of harm's way. Serbian medic Dragoljub Radojkovic was in the midst of the fighting. I look out of the trench and see a wounded man on the parapet. I shout to him, but he doesn't hear me. He's hit again and faints. Some men carry him in, and blood is gushing from his neck. I wrap one bandage, then another. We get him onto a stretcher, but the man dies. In the end, the Serbian artillery carried the day, and the Serbs won the Battle of Kumanovo. The victory earned Putnik the title of Vojvoda, left the Serbs in possession of the part of Macedonia disputed with the Bulgarians, and routed the Ottomans, who fled to the south. Another result was chaos amongst the local Muslim population, and many dead and wounded on both sides. Radojkovic was at the train station a day after the battle. In the morning, we went down to the train station in Kumanovo captured Turks, the Turkish people, women, children, everything was crowded there. The trains were not running. Mm. One freight train was full of wounded and another full of dead Turks. Blood dripped from the wagon onto the rails. The Serbs pursued and pushed the Ottomans back at the battles of Prilep and Monastir, while the Ottomans withdrew to southern Albania. The Serbs also moved forces west towards Scutari and the Adriatic coast, where they joined Montenegrin forces besieging the town. In the north, the Serbs also captured the Sanjak of Novi Pazar and the town of Prizren, which the Montenegrins had wanted. Serbian troops also enter Kosovo, but face resistance from mm. local Albanians. In the south, the Greek army of Thessaly made straight for Salonika. Greece was also interested in Macedonia, but they prioritized the drive for Salonika to reach it before the Bulgarians could. Greek troops pushed the Ottomans aside at Sarantaporos Pass and with more difficulty at Yanitsa. The way to Salonika was open and the Greek army surrounded the city on November 7th. A Bulgarian division rushed south and the commander sent a message ahead asking the Ottomans to surrender to him instead of to the Greeks. But it was too <laughs> late. The Ottoman <laughs> commander replied... Nice, so trying to rush ahead for your team... <laughs> from your teammate here to try and get the glory in of itself. Yeah, this is definitely a, a fragile alliance. This really seems more like the enemy of my enemy is my friend, you know, rather than the Balkan League here actually cooperating. But still, it's fascinating to see these multiple countries here fighting the Ottomans on multiple fronts, each using their own advantages and really squeezing in on the piece of territory they had. They showed the map before there where you could see all of modern Turkey and now uh, modern, excuse me, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, Jordan, etc. All the countries that the Ottoman Empire controlled. But how much of that really counts for anything when 
all your troops are now concentrated not only across Libya, but then you also have um, them on the in the Middle East as well. Sorry, just phone going off there. That's okay though. And um, yeah, exactly. So just the, to see the sort of concentration of all these troops is, is actually pretty cool. ...that he only had one Salonika and he had surrendered it to the Greeks on November 8th. This was a critical league victory as Ottoman forces were now completely cut off from any hope of reinforcement. It was also a personal tragedy <laughs> for Ottoman officer Mustafa Kemal mm -hmm. as it was his hometown and fueled his anger at Constantinople. Yep. Then one day I heard my homeland Salonika, my mother, my sister, my relatives and acquaintances were handed over to the enemy by the very Ottoman leadership who expelled me for unveiling the truth about them. Kemal also said that he would have fired every Ottoman officer above the rank of major. After taking Salonika, Greek and Bulgarian troops began an uneasy joint presence in the city. In the west, Greek troops also made progress and besieged the Ottoman fortress at Yanina. As the Balkan League armies advanced, the Christian and Muslim civilian populations suffered from atrocities committed by all sides. Yep. This was made worse by the presence of irregular forces of locals who supported their countrymen's armies, but also blurred the line between soldiers and non-combatants for enemy troops. Some Christians turned on Muslim officials who had repressed them in the past, or on Muslim and sometimes Christian landowners before seizing their lands. A British journalist with the Bulgarian army reported, The track of the Bulgarian army in Thrace is marked by 80 miles of ruined villages. Yeah, and I think that's, that's also the thing too that makes these, this, particularly, this particular front of Europe to be extra brutal, is that you have the multiple cultures that are living amongst each other, Christians, Muslims, dif different ethnicities, multiple languages, different claims. It's just, it's a very tense area that I don't, in my opinion, doesn't really exist anywhere else uh, in Europe, on continental Europe. And so to hear about this, I mean, later there would obviously go on to be the Armenian genocide as well, um, just a few years after this during the First World War. And so, yeah, ethnic tensions in Europe and it's just tragic. Greek commander Crown Prince Constantine ordered Muslim villages destroyed since he claimed yeah. that Muslims were shooting at his troops. And Greek soldier Stratis Mirivilis later included his experience in his writing. All male prisoners in the village were to be executed. I was opposite an old Turk. His grandfatherly face was bruised. He whispered prayers and his silky beard moved in the wind. I pulled the trigger yeah. and he fell into the mud like he was struck by lightning. After the executions, we set the village on fire. Suddenly, a frenzied crowd rushed over. Children and women freed from the mosque where we had imprisoned them. They run to the corpses screaming to look for their loved ones. This memory lives and circulates inside me like an anguished virus. Constantinople was filled with hundreds of thousands of Muslim refugees, with the old city turned into a camp, including the famous Blue Mosque and the Hagia Sophia Mosque turned into a cholera hospital. Mm. The British consul at Salonika was blunt. The result of the massacre of Muslims at the beginning of the war, of the looting of their goods in the ensuing months, of the settling of Christians in their villages, of their persecution by Christian neighbors, of their torture and beating by Greek troops, has been the creation of a state of terror amongst the Islamic population. Their one desire is to escape from Macedonia and to be again in a free land. Mm -hmm. The powers sent warships to Constantinople to protect the city's Christian population from what they feared might be revenge killings by Muslims. In just a few weeks, the Balkan League had put to- Just a few weeks, all of these events have transpired. Though, again, already, so quickly, and these would go to have effects for multiple decades on this region. Fascinating. Together, a string of decisive victories. Nearly all of Ottoman Europe was now under their control, except for the fortresses of Edirne, Yanina, and Scutari. As a result of the Ottoman collapse, an Albanian group supported by Austria and Italy declared hmm. independence on the. Because, of course, you can't have the other European powers just sitting by and doing nothing. November 28, 1912. 
On December 3rd, the Ottomans signed an armistice with Bulgaria, Montenegro and Serbia, but Greek military operations continued. So the Balkan League was victorious on all fronts, but despite the armistice, the war was not over, and the great powers were on the cusp of getting involved themselves. Even though the Ottoman armies were beaten in the field and the fleet was bottled up by the stronger Greek navy, militarily the empire might have had a chance to recover. It still held important fortresses, it was holding on the Chatalja line, had more reserves in Asia, and the Balkan League was divided over the possible spoils. But the Ottomans had no allies. This time, the great powers would not support the empire as they had in the past. And even this look like French and German troops, no? And Germany declared that the war was, quote, a free fight with no favor. The powers now said that they would go back on their declaration about the territorial status quo and accept border changes in favor of the League. Even Austro-Hungarian Foreign Minister Leopold Berthold said that Vienna would not oppose Serbian expansion except for an Adriatic port. Russia was now worried that the Bulgarians might actually get to Constantinople before them, and so they urged restraint. The events in the Balkans had also pushed Europe to the brink of war. On November 21st, Austria-Hungary acted to, in its view, prevent Serbia from permanently occupying the Adriatic coast. Vienna mobilized six army corps, three facing the Balkans and three facing Russia. Kaiser Wilhelm secretly assured the Austrians that if Russia mobilized, Germany would support Austria, yes. just as he would do again in July 1914. And this is the one of the pieces of evidence that say that the First World War was inevitable, right? So obviously, with the Second World War and the way that events transpired, obviously during the 1920s, the authoritarianism, which would then happen, the collapse of the Weimar Republic, Right. You can sort of look at a couple of events and say, OK, maybe this wasn't possible. Right. Maybe this could not have happened in the way it out of right if a few key decisions were made. But by this point, World War One is almost certainly bound to happen in some sort of way. There was bound to be some sort of great conflict between the great powers. And this isn't just like, oh, this is the one thing. And then sure, it's bound to happen. But it's the decades beforehand. Kaiser Wilhelm I, the naval arms race. Right. The fact that these great the great powers at this point are really looking for conflict in the name of national sovereignty, in the name of national rejuvenation, whatever it is that you wanted to call it um, in your country. In response to the Austrian moves, the Tsar held a meeting with his war council and the army drew up plans for a partial mobilization. But the council decided not to mobilize, partly out of fear of provoking Germany, and partly because some ministers didn't want to risk war over Serbian access to the sea. The German government did not know how close the Russians had come to mobilizing when they held their own infamous war council meeting on December 8th. Chief of the General Staff von Moltke felt that Germany should declare war now, before Russia got any stronger. But in the end, the council decided against it. Following the war scare and December armistice, two parallel conferences took place in London on December 16th and 17th, 1912. At the first conference, Ottoman delegate Reshid Pasha said that his government would give up Macedonia and Salonika, but not Edirne, Eastern Thrace, or the four islands at the mouth of the Dardanelles that Greece was demanding. Of course. The Ottomans also insisted on an independent Albania rather than it being split between the Serbs, Montenegrins, and Greeks. The Bulgarians made a new demand for Edirne to compensate for the lands that they might lose to the Serbs, but this was a particular sticking point because the fortress city was important for the safety of Constantinople. Rashid Pasha put it simply to the Bulgarian representative. Edirne is a window into our harem. <laughs> the Greeks and Bulgarians argued over who would get Salonika, while the Serbs and Bulgarians argued over Macedonia. Meanwhile, at the separate Great Powers Conference, the main topic was the borders of Albania, of critical importance for Austria-Hungary to limit Serbian power. Yeah. But events in Constantinople overtook diplomacy. On January 23, 1913, a young Turk government took power again after yet another coup and the murder of War Minister Nazim Pasha. Supported by influential Turkish officers like Enver Bey, many of whom came from the Balkan lands that were now lost, they decided to continue the war to prevent the loss of Thrace. 
new Ottoman foreign minister Nuradun Yan Efendi was defiant. If Edirne continues to resist, we shall fight to relieve her. If Edirne falls, we shall fight to retake her. Ottoman troops, including Mustafa Kemal, landed on Gallipoli on February 7th, and at first they pushed the Bulgarians back around Bulayir. But the Bulgarians rallied and the Ottoman attack failed with the loss of 6,000 dead to just 114 Bulgarians. What is, what is it about Gallipoli? Right? I've, I've never actually seen photos of the landscape there, but th this has got to be one of the most difficult like, pieces of land to take in all of Europe, no? Right? Something about Gallipoli. Elsewhere, the Greeks took Yanina on March 6th, and the Bulgarians and Serbians finally captured Edirne on March 26th. French journalist Gustave Cyrilli described the state of the people in the starving city. It was like a scene out of a fantastic tale to see these human rags with protruding teeth devouring a sort of bread, black lava in which the barely ground seeds fell out in yellow spots. Those who did not get their share of the fought over morsels watched the others savor them with envious tears in their eyes. At Scutari, Serbian troops arrived to help the Montenegrins who ignored warnings from the great powers and assaulted the city. A combined fleet of the powers blockaded Montenegro, causing the Serbs to leave. But the Montenegrins managed to take the city April 24th, only to agree to give it up to a future independent Albania just days later. The Ottomans had no choice but to accept a peace deal, and the belligerents signed the Treaty of London on May 30th, 1913, which reduced Ottoman Europe to a small strip of land outside of Constantinople and created the Principality of Albania. Crazy. The first Balkan. I mean, look at that, right? Look at that. All within a few weeks, the entire map of southeastern Europe is redrawn. All right, all these new nationalities have now been created. An Albanian nationality has been created, and it's already sowed the seeds for the next conflict, which would take which would take place less than a year later. And created the Principality of Albania. The First Balkan War came to an end in May 1913, and the Ottoman Empire in Europe seemed to be a thing of the past. Mm, but the borders between the victorious Balkan League members are another matter altogether. Mm -hmm. Even before the First Balkan War had come to an end, further conflict was brewing. Not only did the Balkan League members dispute where the new borders would be, but Romania had also begun to make demands for southern Dobruja, which was part of Bulgaria. In May 1913, the powers awarded the town of Silistra to Romania, which angered both sides and made some Bulgarians doubt Russia as a reliable ally. Bulgarians were also frustrated because in their view, they'd won the strategically important Thrace battles, but the Serbs were left in possession of most of Macedonia and didn't want to honor the pre-war agreement. Bulgaria and Greece were also still in conflict over Salonika. Russia tried to mediate between Serbia and Bulgaria, but the two rivals could not agree, and the Russians were still nervous about Bulgarian troops so close to Constantinople. The Bulgarian army was in a fragile state, as many soldiers were exhausted from the war, and some were willing to split Macedonia with their allies if it meant peace. Hmm. General Savov told the government to either send the men home or go to war now. Without strong Russian backing, Sofia feared it might lose Macedonia for good, so the Tsar ordered an attack against Serbia and Greece on June 29th. Yeah. Although it's not clear how much the government knows about this before the shooting starts. So I think that, I might be wrong here, correct me if in the comments, but I'm pretty sure that the First Balkan Wars were remembered quite well in B Bulgarian history. It's obviously, it's celebrated in a manner, right? It was one of the pushes against the Ottoman Empire. They reclaimed a lot of territory. But then the Second Balkan War, not as much, right? So with the rest of the... Balkan League obviously fracturing here and then fighting against Bulgaria, them declaring war, them arguably being the aggressors in this. I don't know if really that part is as well remembered and certainly most probably not celebrated. The Second Balkan War had begun. The Bulgarian Prime Minister tried to stop the fighting in Macedonia, but it was too late. Yeah. The Greeks and Serbs could claim that Bulgaria was the aggressor and agreed to divide Macedonia between themselves. 
Montenegro also joined to stay in Serbia's good graces. On the Bulgarian side, the sudden attack had confused communication and hampered operations. And I mean, look at this. After just fighting the Ottomans, right, taking up the, br the brunt of the fighting through here, almost pushing into Constantinople, and now you're fighting a two-front, depending on the way you look at it, regardless, a multi-front war now against not only your former allies, but also Romania, who was not fighting the Ottomans whatsoever. Yeah, tough break. Their attack was uncoordinated, and the Serbs eventually stopped it and defeated the Bulgarians at Bregalnica by July 8th. The Greeks defeated a smaller Bulgarian army around Kilkis and Doiran around the same time, and eliminated isolated Bulgarian units at Salonika. Bulgarian Mikhail Majarov's son was killed in the fighting. I lost my very last hope. From that moment forth, I became a man haunted by grief. All around me seemed to go dark. All the misery and all the sorrow of Bulgaria appeared to me to be twice as great. Each and every object in my home served as a reminder to me of my lost happiness. Yeah. On July 11th, Greek and Serb forces met and the front stabilized. Retreating Bulgarians attacked Greek, Turkish and Serbian civilians, and advancing Greek and Serbian troops committed atrocities against Bulgarian civilians, yeah. again after claims of attacks against their own troops. Turkish civilian Ibo Shaha felt empathy for Bulgarian refugees. A Bulgarian peasant was leading a scrawny donkey on the wooden saddle of which sat a child, her bare legs dangling on one side. The misery, the look of a dread and utter agony in the small, blinking eyes of the pockmarked face with the yellow, straggly beard were the very embodiment of human fear and despair. No, not human. It was the animal dread of cattle at the slaughterhouse, the wild, glassy stare of terror in a cornered animal. It was a look which, once perceived, made one cringe with shame and humiliation, the shame of its having been in a human eye. Meanwhile, Romania saw its chance and entered the war on July 10th to take all of southern Dobruja. A quarter of a million Romanian troops of the Army of the Danube entered Bulgaria and moved towards Sofia. The Bulgarians decided not to offer organized resistance. Advancing Romanian troops, however, rode straight into a cholera epidemic due to unsanitary conditions. Ooh. Chaplain Dumitru Brumoshescu complained bitterly about the army's Ooh. lack of medical care. In the hospital, there are no beds, so the men lie on the floor in their uniforms. They've barely the strength to moan or ask for water. Some are delirious with spasmodic movements of their arms and hands. Some vomit onto the floor, while others relieve themselves where they lay. The lack of furniture, dishes, linens, medical devices, medicine, and antiseptic rendered the presence of army doctors useless. I've seen a lot of messes, but this one topped them all. About 2,700 Romanian soldiers die of cholera in summer 1913. Wow. Now the Ottomans saw their opportunity to recover parts of Thrace, so they crossed the Chatalja line on July 12th. The few Bulgarian troops left in the area could offer only token resistance, and the Ottomans recaptured the fortress of Edirne without firing a shot on July 23rd. Many Bulgarian civilians fled, creating a new wave of refugees, and another outbreak of cholera killed 4,000 Ottoman troops. As Romanian troops got closer to Sofia and Russia, it seems like cholera is the real killer in this in this whole Balkan. Russia episode. refused to intervene to help Bulgaria. The pro-Russian Bulgarian yeah. government resigned. It was replaced by a pro-German government under Vasil Radoslavov, but fighting continued. And this would obviously have huge consequences. I haven't been talking too much about World War One because, you know, I have a feeling that if you're watching this video, you're already at least somewhat familiar with it. Probably more familiar, actually. Who am I kidding? But yeah, obviously having a pro-German government in 1913 is going to lead you down a road to conflict, which would bring Bulgaria into the First World War. They would eventually get their revenge, so to say, on Serbia after the Austro-Hungarians were not able to defeat the Serbians, which was an embarrassment in and of itself to, to, the, to, the, to the empire there. But so they would push in, they would eventually crush Serbia. And then having that pro-German government as well during the Second World War, 
would also bring Bulgaria into a state of, um, yeah, I think you know the history from there. Bulgarian forces recovered to win a defensive battle against the Serbs and Montenegrins at Kalimansi and a successful counterattack against the Greeks at Kresna Gorge. The Greeks asked for an armistice, and Sofia ordered a stop to operations since even a Bulgarian victory could not reverse the tide of the war. The peace treaties signed in August and September 1913 ended the Second Balkan War and redrew the map of the Balkans yet again, again. this time to Bulgaria's disadvantage. Romania got southern Dobruja. Austria-Hungary and Russia refused to support Serbian maximalist demands in Macedonia so they could retain some influence with Bulgaria. Serbia did get most of Macedonia, but Bulgaria kept apart and Greece kept Salonika. The Ottomans regained eastern Thrace despite their defeat in the First War. Crazy. The Balkan Wars left a lasting impact on the region and Europe as a whole. The fighting and the cholera were deadly. One Shortly after this too, <laughs> Greece would also go to war over this piece of territory too and would be rewarded. I can't remember the exact year though, but this isn't quite the final borders yet. 125,000 Ottoman soldiers died. I'm oh, sorry, it was a Greco-Turkish war, obviously. Along with 65,000 Bulgarians, 36,000 Serbs, 9,500 Greeks, and 3,000 Montenegrins. After more than 600 years, the Ottoman presence in the Balkans was nearly gone. Albania was independent, but its neighbors claimed its territory. And many Balkan Christians saw the change as the end of foreign domination and oppression. For more than 300,000 Balkan Muslims, however, the changes meant expulsion from their homes and an uncertain future in Anatolia. And for some young Turks, it meant radicalization against Christians still within the empire. Enver Pasha, who hailed from the Balkans and would later play a key role in the Armenian genocide and the killing of Ottoman Greeks in the First World War, shared his anger. How could anyone forget the plains, the meadows, watered with the blood of our forefathers? Abandon those places where Turkish raiders had stalled their steeds for a full 400 years, with our mosques, our tombs, our dervish lodges, our bridges and our castles, to leave them to our slaves, to be driven out of the Balkans to Anatolia. This is beyond a man's endurance to leave them to our slaves. Isn't that, uh, isn't that quite telling? I am prepared to sacrifice gladly the remaining years of my life to take revenge on the Bulgarians, the Greeks, and the Montenegrins. No. The events of 1912-13 helped to create the conditions for the catastrophe of 1914 as well. Bulgarian resentment at the lack of support from Russia caused it to drift closer to Austria-Hungary and Germany. Yep. And tensions between Austria-Hungary and a much larger Serbia also increased. With Serbia as Russia's only remaining Balkan ally, Russia would be under more pressure to support Serbia in any future conflict. And in October 1913, Austria issued an ultimatum to Serbia with German support mm -hmm. to force Belgrade to remove its troops from northern Albania. A similar ultimatum in 1914 would transform the Third Balkan War into the Great War. The complex tragedy of the Balkan Wars is just one of the conflicts that we think it's important to cover in our documentary series. We also made an epic documentary about the Battle of Berlin in 1945 called 16 Days in Berlin. Hmm. It's four and a half hours long, oh over 18 God. episodes, taking you through wow. the battle day by day. It features original film footage from Soviet cameramen, never before seen photos of the battle, detailed cool. maps and animations, and expert interviews with David Willey from the Tank Museum, Ian from Forgotten Weapons, and more. Unfortunately, we can't upload this series to YouTube because it shows the grim reality of the Second World War, and that would get us demonetized or worse. Yep. So where can you watch 16 Days in Berlin in 4K resolution? And do it. Visit realtimehistory.net. Cool, that was a fantastic video. Of the prologue to the First World War, not sure how much it is forgotten, but nonetheless, I hope you all enjoyed this. Sorry, I didn't have too much to say on this one, but I actually learned a ton. I hadn't realized specific uh, some of the, the the fronts of the conflicts and what the actual troop counts were and everything like this. So, hey, thank you very much for watching along. If you made it this far, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Take care. Thank you for joining me again. I'll see you guys in the next one.